Well, uh, hey everybody, welcome back. Thank you for joining us on our week three of our uh, Race and Faith Black Women series. Sorry about last week, uh, Lawanda and Tamika had um, a loss in the family, so they had to they had to do some. Uh, well, they had to fly to Houston for a funeral, so uh, we postponed our series, but. We th I'm thinking this will probably be our last one, um, but I think it'll be definitely maybe, uh, might be our most robust uh, conversation that we are going to have. So uh, just a few ground rules. Uh, we just want to listen to the ladies speak. Um, we want to hear their voices. We believe God has given them a lot of truth, a lot of prophetic wisdom, insight, and so we want to listen to them. Uh, if there are anything, though, that you do have questions on, uh, you know, we have a small group here uh, tonight. Feel free to write a question in the chat, and, uh, <clears throat> and maybe we can have time to answer it tonight. If there are things that even, you know, you disagree with or maybe it challenges you, makes you feel uncomfortable, uh, man, I'd love for you to, to come talk to me uh, and just be kind of communicate that to me. So we can like let the ladies just feel comfortable and, and just let them just speak uh, without hindrance. So uh, that being said, uh, yeah, we're doing week three of our Race and Faith Black Women series. And so today's uh, or tonight's conversation is actually racism in the church. So this one is going to be a doozy. And, uh, you know, we might ask, like, hey, why are we talking about racism in the church? Um, I think it's important as a church for us, um, not the well community church, uh, lowercase c, but the even uh, the church uh, capital C, uh, for us to be honest, you know, um, the church isn't perfect. And that doesn't mean our Christianity isn't true and right. Uh, we know our God is perfect. We know our God is holy, uh, but he uses imperfect people. And oftentimes we get it wrong. Um, and I think what we're going to learn tonight is that uh, our church, uh, our church, capital C, and maybe the well, lowercase c, we've gone it wrong a lot of times. And so uh, that's why we want to address this, because I think it's good to kind of honestly reflect on our strengths and our weaknesses so that, um, so that we can move forward and reflect Christ in, in a better and, and hopefully a greater way. So that being said, we got our, our three panelists uh, with us today. We got Jennifer Bogner. Jennifer, how are you? I'm great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, the queen of everything, Lawanda Townsend. How, how's your Sunday been, Lawanda? Great. Wonderful. Wonderful. I should change my name to the king of everything, but uh, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have the same, same ring to it. Please don't. And then my uh, favorite person in your family, Lawanda Tamikia Jackson. You don't butter me up like that. <laughs> Don't lie, David. You're supposed okay, to be it's okay. Accurate, honest. <laughs> we know. I uh, we've already established that Luanda is your uh, wrangler, so <laughs> it's okay. She could be your favorite. Yeah. I'll just be me. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, let's just get into this. So uh, glad um, glad y'all are back. And uh, first question, just a softball question. But how have you experienced racism uh, within the church? And that could be uh, the Well Community Church or just growing up in church. How have you experienced racism in the church? Luanda, let's start with you because your mic is not muted. So. All right. So um, I think a very good example was of. Um, when I was younger, um, we had a turnover from leadership in our church, and everyone, including all the students and everyone in our student ministry, knew who was going to be promoted the position of student pastor. Um, and he was this Black man who had been at the church for maybe 15 years. He'd done um, every children's ministry. Um, he'd worked with the youth. He was an 
excellent pastor, excellent storyteller, very well spoken, very well respected. And we all knew that he was going to get this promotion to be um, the youth pastor of our church. And we had a very large church at the time. Um, so when they decided to go with an outside hire um, and they put a white man over him, even though the church's policy was promote from the inside, um, it was just like this severe blow um, to all, I mean, it wasn't just um, like him and his family, but it was devastating to like our community, um, our youth group, our, um, like our, just our church body, um, that the leadership in the church wanted to see more white leadership instead of promoting within, and they had groomed this man, um, uh, but they promoted, um, they didn't promote anyone, they just got someone actually from California, um, to come and, be over the youth, um, to be the youth pastor, and it did not work out very well. Um, within a year, he was gone, but the um, so was the gentleman that they did not promote either. So, just um, I, Lawanda and I, of course, we went to the same church, and I know this incident. We we've actually talked about it before now, and we. Later on in life, I think we figured out that we experienced it very similarly um, in terms of this also being um, a moment that it was, it, it just didn't feel like a personal slight. Um, it seems like something else was going on. And I think there is a temptation often to say like, oh, well, maybe there's something you didn't know about, or perhaps this, um, you know, that he was offered the the position and turned it down. That definitely didn't happen. <laughs> that we know for sure. Our parents were friends. But, um, you know, it also prompted me to look at who was in charge at our church. Mm -hmm. And we went to um, a rather large church. Um, I think at the time it was like 8,000 or so people. And the population of the, um, of the church was diverse, but the people who you saw in leadership were primarily white people. I think in the time that I went there as a, as a, um, a young person, I guess, I went there until I graduated from high school, um, I, there was one pastor who was not white and not only were they all white, but they all lived in this, sub, in the same like suburban area within Houston. And it was kind of weird because people from all over Houston um, would come to this church, but this, this, uh, the leaders, everyone, it was almost like when you got promoted to leadership, you had to move to this neighborhood. <laughs> um, and so it was this sort of, this lack of diversity in so many ways um, that really made you kind of question exactly what, made me question exactly what was going on there and um, really made me look around and kind of see just that th this is a very homogenous um, experience in terms of what the leadership looked like and, and who had real say in the church. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I will say, um, as far as this goes, just to kind of tack on to that, the pastor that they, the youth pastor that they brought in, he made a, a number of changes to the, to the youth group that they just weren't great changes for the youth that went there. Like, honestly, the population was primarily black and brown students. We did have some uh, white students who were a part of the population. We had some Indian students. We had some um, Asian students who were a part of the population. But primarily, it was black and brown kids, black and Hispanic, really. Um, and the type of services that we went to just weren't suited, I think, for for really reaching the population that was there, it's like they were trying to drive towards having this particular sort of youth group. And one example of this, I, I don't, th I think it was actually the second youth, pa youth pastor that they brought in. We went to a camp in Oklahoma. It was the only time that we've gone to a camp out of state. And the, the camp blared rock music all day long. And this just- seven. It stands out because it was so different 
from what we were used to. And at that camp, we were the only group that was really diverse. We were the only group that had um, a, a mix of kids from different backgrounds. And it made us feel very uncomfortable and out of place. And Lawanda and I have been to so many Christian camps, like especially, you know, just church camps, that it's unusual for us to feel that way. But at that church, mm -hmm. at that camp, it was just like, who are you catering to? Because it's not me. Mm -hmm. Who are you reaching might be a better statement. Yeah. Um, that brings to mind, just kind of talking about diversity and things like that, that brings to mind um, one specific instance for me, or not one, but I guess instances of having conversations with um, other believers. And I have a close friend slash mentor who just recently was asking me about um, the leadership at her church, which is, I think, mostly white. Um, and she was saying that they're trying to rework their website so it's more appealing to people when they're looking for churches um, online. And she was asking me, what do you think about this? Like basically every single person in our pictures on our website is white. And I think that that might be off-putting to people of other backgrounds who are not white that would be interested in coming to our church. And she kind of had to wrestle with other people on the leadership team who really believe that there's no reason for them to have pictures of black or brown or any other race of people on the website that that's ridiculous they shouldn't have to change that um because we just know that we're welcoming to everyone um but that's just kind of counter intuitive maybe to me because i am not white knowing that i can look like when i look at a church's website that's not necessarily what um is what tells me this is the church i need to go to because look at their website but i can tell you one thing it tells me when i'm looking at what your church website looks like and see that there's not a single face that looks like mine that it it just doesn't make me feel welcome it doesn't make me feel like i'm going to be accepted i'm going to be valued i'm going to be um, welcomed as an equal person of value at the church. And so while that's not uh, necessarily hatred, it's not racism as we think about racism like that, but it's racism in the sense of a disregard for people that are different. And it's just kind of um, a lack of consideration, I'd say, of people that are not the majority. Um, and that does it disadvantages people of color, kind of puts them off to the side. So that's just one example where people in majority just think it doesn't matter if we represent the minority and it's okay if we don't, we just know on the inside that we're welcoming. Um, but that shouldn't that say something to you in the first place where you're not, you're not welcoming enough to even have different faces and things represented on the websites. So that is just one of a lot of different types of conversations that are had about what does what does it look like to like why do we need diversity i think there's a lot of in church conversations as to why does diversity matter for all the same in christ but it's kind of using this we're all one in christ in not necessarily the way that it ought to be used so i'd say that's one example and then the other one that i'll share is one from another different church close mentor who is um white and she was sharing with our Bible study group about who was also almost all white um, women a couple women of uh minority women women of color and she was talking about her professor i think um, at the christian university that she went to and he was sharing with his class that the most godly person that he knew was his father but he was a racist until like a hardcore racist till the day he died and being on that call, the only black person that particular day, the only person of color even that particular day, that was just so hurtful because it was like, oh yeah, you know, it was kind of like, a, oh, they kind of were putting it off as, yeah, we all have our sin nature. We all sin in some kind of way. He just happened to be a racist. It wasn't like a, well, that's despicable. And that's sad that the most godly person you knew was like a serious racist, you know? Um, and I think that we, a lot of times in church, we don't do that necessarily with other types of sin. We don't say, the godliest person I knew was my dad, but he just kept cheating on my mom. Ugh, we all have a sin nature. We don't say that about murderers, pathological liars, 
thieves, criminals, but for some reason when it comes to racism in the church, I think it's a lot easier for us to say, oh, but you know, we all sin. It's just this heart issue. So that's another way that I think that I see, um, I have experienced racism in the church of just people not caring about that particular sin. Um, in my close circles, people that I know that love me, but don't see this kind of evil ideology that they have in their hearts and this past that they give to other people's racism inside the church. Wow, that's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can relate with that, right? I mean, I think, yeah, Jennifer, that's probably convicting for me because I'm, I'm thinking like, I, that, I say a lot of the same things about my relatives, like, they're great, but, you know, but there's certain uh, sins that we, that we have, that we, we do or that we know other people have that we kind of view it as acceptable sins. Um, that's a really, that's a really good point. And, you know, racism in the church, it's, it's happening today, but uh, as I think we all know, it's, and it's a historical thing. And especially uh, with the Western church and there's a history of the Western church of being uh, whitewashed, to be honest. And so we wanted to kind of transition to talking about uh, the historical whitewashing of Christianity and how we see that expressed in the past, but even how we uh, see it expressed today. So ladies, um, how has the historical um, whitewashing of Christianity affected you as a black uh, woman? Um, so I will say um it's very uncomfortable um it's it's also disingenuous like to preach tolerance and love when you can't admit to yourself that jesus is not a white man um that he is not from denver or <laughs> or somewhere in europe <laughs> um and it it doesn't make any sense. I, I'm just thinking back to um, Eric Metaxas tweet that said, did, you know, Jesus was white. Did he have white privilege, even though he was entirely without sin? And the entire, that entire statement, like there's something wrong with the entire statement. Uh, the first part, Jesus was white. Jesus, you know, he was never white. Um, he had <laughs> he was jewish in um a long ago jewish day living in a jewish nation um and he didn't have white privilege because one he wasn't right and two he was the son of a carpenter and three he was born in a manger and four he lived his life um not being the richest person in the world he didn't even work a regular job so <laughs> He was more of a wandering prophet. That's what he was. He was a wandering prophet. And so um, to be that confused with your uh, religious teaching is problematic, to say the least. Um, but I think back to even like before Twitter was all the rage and all this stuff. Uh, when I was in college, I so I, I have a dual degree in entrepreneurship and Christianity. So a large part of my um, college experience was studying the Bible. And I think I said this before, um, I think that was probably the driest season of my life was studying the um, New Testament. It was awful. Uh, but we often studied Augustine's writings and his works and his teachings. And at some point, um, we began talking about where Augustine was born and they had all these pictures up of Augustine and how uh, the great theologian he was and how all these other people who came after him drew on his works. Um, and I love Augustine. To read Augustine is just, it's just glorious. It's beautiful. It's so enlightening. Um, but Augustine is not white. Um, and when you go back through the artistry to the day that he lived, he is an African, he's from an African nation. He, um, you know, they, they began whitewashing him throughout history. They began erasing his African features. They began lightening his hair until today's picture of Augustine is a white haired Roman man, um, which 
that's another issue, but <laughs> the Romans also um, had a lot of color. Anyway, um, he is not a white theologian, and I don't understand the need to make him white. It is, if we are all the same in Jesus, if God has um, come to this earth in the form of Jesus and he has freed us from, from our sins and he has broken these bondages from us, why do you need your heroes to look like you? Why can't they look like me? Esther was a woman. She was a woman of color and she was a hero to the Jewish nation. She looked like me. <laughs> and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's beautiful. And if she looked like you, I think it's beautiful. And if, you know, David looks like, you know, David there. <laughs> I've been told Jesus. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> Please don't, don't start with me, David. No. <laughs> if he looked like um, David, I would think that that was beautiful because God used so many people in the lineage of Jesus that there's no reason for us to whitewash the Bible, but there is this ideology that we discussed the last time that white is right. And because white has to be right, then everybody represented it in the Bible that was good has to also be white. And that's problematic. Yeah, that reminds me of probably three weeks ago, so you can see how deeply ingrained it was. It was up to three weeks ago that this happened. I was sitting with my now three-year-old, um, who three weeks ago wasn't even three years old yet, but we were sitting and I was trying to distract him. So we had this little Christmas coloring book. And so of course there's baby Jesus in a manger, there's angels and stars and all kinds of things to represent that stereotypical Christmas scene that we think of um, when we think of Christian Christmas. Um, and so there's angels. And immediately I start coloring the angels blonde haired and blue eyed. Why? Because growing up, that is the way that all movies, children's Bibles, everything depicts angels and um just the israelite people as white people and so it literally took me a little bit to see me coloring this um angel with a white face and having a yellow marker to color the angel's hair that i shocked myself i was like wow it is this deeply ingrained in me because of what media shows me and what all of these old bibles and things like that show us of white jesus and white pictures of all the israelites and angels and the good people and things like that, that's just another example of the history of whitewashing that our angels have to be white because white is right and pure and whatever it is, such that even now I should be so affected by it that that's just my natural instinct is to color them this way. So that was something that was actually shocking to me recently, especially because I've been more mindful of getting like newer children's Bibles these days that are trying to do a better job of being um, more accurate in what the Bible character should look like, at least with their skin tone and things like that. So I've been very kind of cognizant of that and trying to, oh, make sure my children can see, this is actually more like what the Israelites would have looked like. Not that it matters, but if we're going to draw pictures of them, let's make sure it's more um, historically accurate. But even with that still being so kind, not to say brainwashed, but you know, just it's ingrained in my mind that this is what they're supposed to look like. Um, and then having conversations with people or seeing conversations being had that people genuinely get angry when you try to say that Jesus was not white. Um, and again, having to ask, why are you angry? Why are you mad at the thought of Jesus not being white? Why does that so deeply bother you? There, there's something um, kind of sinister there. Um, so just another example of the whitewashing of Christianity there. Um, another one I would say would be, um, and this is something I learned in the class that I took called Perspectives. And it was really cool because it's teaching us about like God's heart for the world and world missions and things like that. And one of the things that um, one of the teachers was saying one day was talking about how a lot of times 
one of the issues with missionaries from the West would be that they would try to make the, the countries that they would go to, the villages and things like that, as they're trying to evangelize and teach people to follow Jesus, they would really be packaging it in a Eurocentric Western or white American, whatever you want to call it, package. So they were teaching people, instead of teaching them to be like Jesus, they were teaching them to be like Western white Christians. Um, and that in and of itself, just being wrong, because Jesus doesn't say that we need to be like Anglo-Saxons. Jesus says you need to be like me. So whatever that looks like within their cultural context is what the missionary should have been kind of teaching the um, people to walk out. But instead they're saying, this is how worship services need to go. The way that we tend to see white worship services going. This is the way that you need to dress. This is the style of music that you need to be um, singing for it to be godly music. And that sends this message that your culture, your way of being is inherently wrong. The godlier way to be is this Eurocentric Western version of Christianity. So that's just another um, way the, that we have in the past and sometimes unfortunately still do um, whitewash Christianity. Uh, Tamikia, anything you'd want to add to? Um, yeah, I totally I agree with the things that Luanda and Jennifer um, have said, and just in particular the things that uh, Jennifer, what you just said about like, I I think it I think it goes so much further than that, and I think your example of the way that you would just automatically color an angel just shows the um, unconscious levels that it activates at, and you know. Um, it's like we, we're, we're talking about our personal experiences here, but this also operates on a different systemic level, you know, because then it creates these parallels with what is considered goodness, which then becomes, uh, which then becomes whiteness. It creates these ideas of savior complexes. Like all of this stuff is rooted in this idea that um, whiteness equals righteousness. And, it it really has wreaked havoc um, because it's it's been used as, along with the colonization, along with the um, to support the government powers when white nations have gone into other nations um, and really torn their cultures apart. And that like talking for us here and now, and we're talking about what it's like to be a black woman in America, like it seems like that is far away, but it's really not. Because when we look back into history, we find that so much of like black culture, so much of the idea of what does, what does it look like to be a respectable black woman falls in line with what it looks like to be a respectable white woman. There's actually a whole um, theoretical line about the politics of respectability and how because black bodies were so unprotected, especially black women, and were then um, on top of being like unprotected, just overly sexualized, the way that black women found to protect themselves or to try to protect themselves was to press into their churches, to press into wearing dresses and trying to be respectable women, which were good Christian women. It was trying to aspire to be closer to whiteness, um, which again, you know, it, it's a protection that really doesn't work because it, it can't, you know, um, just as just as well as whiteness cannot cover my sins, whiteness cannot keep me from the evil that someone else would do towards me. So it's, I, I think it's, it's so deep. Um, and the the impact of whitewashing the Bible and of creating, of adding Christianity being white or equaling white goodness, um, really it, it's just gone to support our power structure which is against anyone who is not white and um which really like 
privilege and i'm gonna i'm gonna end with it just privileges whiteness <laughs> that's the best thing i can say um there's a there's a great resource if you guys uh and gals ever want to do just a deep dive on this by um uh he co-taught one of my classes his name's uh, dr vince Pontu. if you just google his name I'll, I'll put it in the chat but he does some really just great historical lectures on uh, how Christianity became white. Um, and that actually is like a, it's actually a big kind of stumbling block for a lot of different communities um, when you're trying to bring the gospel in. Uh, because it's like, why would I want that? You know, Christianity is a white man's religion, so to speak. And so he's done a lot of work of trying to debunk like examples of, uh, of Augustine. Like, no, like Augustine, one of the church fathers uh, is a African-American man. So uh, not an African American, not an American. Excuse me. Yes, uh, an African man. Thank you. I was getting ready to correct you. <laughs> like, uh, not American. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, the other side of that is like, what do we lose in not mm -hmm. um, listening to those cultures, not listening to um, or valuing the impact or how God presents Himself in other cultures? You know, because God is not a monolith and he is going to work um, one way around one people and one way around another people based on what you need. God is so equitable, <laughs> um, which I, I mean, I personally love because I strongly believe in that we, we don't all need the same things. We all need something different. And God understands that. Um, and I think we really do ourselves a disservice to say that God can only prove, um, God can only appear or be expressed or be worshiped in this one way. Mm -hmm. uh, to kind of go further in, in the whitewashing of Christianity, I mean, we even historically, we've seen scripture being twisted, right? Uh, to kind of fit a narrative that is convenient. And so for example, the slave Bible, right? Um, and so, Lawanda, I'd love for you, we talk, talked a little bit about this, but could you kind of go a little bit more in depth on, on how scripture has been abused to kind of promote whiteness and, and really do damage to uh, the Black community? Well, I will say, um, starting with the Slave Bible, that they, if, if you've never heard of it, it is the Bible that they gave to the American slaves um, but it had all of the references after um, the children of Israel went to Egypt, um, removed. So their years in slavery and Moses, like um, all, all of that is taken out. How God freed the slaves is gone. Um, so you're missing Exodus, Deuteronomy, Joshua, you know, you're missing all of these pieces. And then the Bible picks back up and they're just a nation. Um, and the reason for that, and then of course they went Further, they went through other parts of the Bible and removed other pieces of it so that um, there was never this belief. They didn't want the slaves to have the information that God wants people to be free. And they they used that Bible to... The church, though, is that... Quote, unquote, um, <laughs> save the slaves without freeing them. So there is, there was a, there's one pastor who definitely was key and in, are instrumental in doing this. He said God had placed it on his heart to go out there and bring Christianity to these slaves. He wanted them um, to receive it, but the slave owners did not want the slaves to pursue freedom. So the compromise was that he would have them come out, accept Christ, be baptized, but before they could get baptized, they'd have to sign a piece of paper that said, I will be um, a Christian and cleansed from my sins with this baptism, but I will not seek my freedom. Um, and I promise to do that because God does not set me free, basically. Um, and that's appalling. And we would look at that today and we would say, oh, I would never do anything like that. Um, and yet, and still, 
we do things like that all the time because you take pieces of a scripture and you apply them the way that you want them to be applied. An example of this can be seen in the scripture, Romans 12 and 16, which says, you hear, they will say it says, live in harmony with one another. Um, and that sounds like a good verse, live in harmony with one another. But the rest of the verse says, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. So the churches that right now say we should not pursue social justice, we should not help the poor, we should not protest, we should not do any of these things, they don't say the rest of the scripture. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. That is key to the passage. You can't just pick and choose what parts of the scripture you want to uphold. You have to uphold all of it. And that is something we see today, yesterday, days gone by, and we we're gonna keep seeing it because if you're in power, it is easy for you to bend truth and make it say what you want it to say. It's easy for you to take a truth, change it a little bit, and then say, well, I've given you the whole truth, but you have not. Yeah, I think it's the whole trying to silence the voice of the oppressed, mm -hmm. and those who seek to help the oppressed. And we have seen as Lawanda was just sharing how that happened with the slave Bible and how it's still happening today. And so I just think about kind of what you were saying, Lawanda, where, we, where there's um, churches now where they're saying, we don't need to talk about this. We don't need to talk about racial injustice. We shouldn't be talking about all this stuff. It's just politics. All people need to hear is about Jesus and the gospel. Then once they get saved, they will just naturally changed and lose their racist ideologies and whatever because of their new nature. But I'm like, even there, you are having to reject so much in scripture about how God feels about the oppressed and how we should love one another and things like that. So I think of Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the great commission, um, which where Jesus explicitly says to teach people to obey his commands. So when we're saying, we don't need to talk about this, all you need to do is this. And, but Jesus is specifically saying, nah, you need to teach people to obey me. And part of that includes, what did Jesus have to say about our neighbors? That we should love them. Um, and which of us could honestly say that based off of all we see in scripture, and even if you only want to look at the red words of Jesus in those colored Bibles, like the actual colored Bibles where the words of Jesus was read, that harboring racist ideologies or condoning the racist ideologies of others, either verbally through our actions or by our silence, is loving our neighbors. And so again, you have to choose to reject part of scripture to fit our own agendas when we are saying, no, 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 the voices of the oppressed, just, shh, no, all we need to talk about is that Jesus saved you from your sins, so you're good, you know, so. And the key to that is not even just love your neighbor, but it's love your neighbor as you as love yourself. yourself. Mm -hmm. I have to love you the same way I love me. Mm -hmm. Do I love me? Yes. Would I hate myself? No. Would I put myself at the bottom? No. Would I step on the back of my own neck? No. Would I put myself in a ghetto and make families and generations grow and raise there? No. Would I deny myself a GI Bill after I fought in a war so that I can't build any wealth? No, I wouldn't do that to myself. So I shouldn't do it to anyone else. Mm -hmm. And I definitely wouldn't put myself in cages, but I go on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even steps it up, even a notch above love your neighbor as you love yourself. In John 13, 34, he says, a new command I give you, love one another as I, Jesus, That's have right. loved you. So you right. must love one another. Right. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna Which, you know, I would just say, I, I think that that is a part of the huge opportunity that we as a larger church have missed, um, is just finding that you are me. Um, how do I not shut down this part of you, but how do I join you in this? Like, how can I hold space with you in this? How can I um, look at the struggle that you're going through 
and come alongside you. And instead of saying, oh, well, that's your struggle or that's your history and you need to get over it, say, hey, let me mourn this with you. I think that is a real opportunity that we have in the church is, is not, or as the church, is not um, using scripture to shut someone down and say, hey, now you can come join us in our way of life, which is what so often happens. You know, um, we, we're talking about silent, silencing the oppressed. It's, there's also just like, as a Black person in the church, I have felt um, so many of the injustices that have been done, like on a large scale, police violence, all of these things that I've, I'm like, oh, that hurts. Oh, that hurts me, you know? And a lot of the times, like until now, I feel like I've not widespread heard pastors talking about these things or addressing these things or offering even space to say, hey, this is um, something that has happened in our community it has affected people in our community you know let's let's have space to talk about it instead a lot of times they've actively turned or turned away um and there's that's not loving someone as yourself it's not loving someone as your neighbor yeah so y'all bring up a, a point that i've been wanting to ask you um you know the church has a history of racism um and we see that still expressed today, right? We kind of pick and choose what verses we want to say and we to justify like, well, we're not going to talk about this because that's political or whatever. It's just, let's just do evangelism, forget about teaching everything that Jesus commanded. Um, but that's created a lot of hurt. Um, you know, there's a, an organization called The Witness. Uh, I think it's a pod. I think oh, it's, a, it's an organization called The Witness, and they have a podcast called Pass the Mic by Jamar Tisby. And it's a great podcast. I'd recommend anyone listen to it. But part of their ministry is to minister to Black Christians who have left uh, the white evangelical church because ultimately it wasn't a safe space for them. And so ladies, I, I wanted to ask you, <clears throat> You know, when we look at the well for our own church, I mean, we are, I would say, diverse in the congregation, but, you know, I'm a pastor, I'm white, Matt Klingler is white, um, and I think our, you know, our culture is very white, right? Um, you know, yeah, our, our church, the well community church is a white culture, uh, <laughs> yeah, and so I don't know how else to say that, but we're just, we're pretty white, even though we have a diverse body, um, our culture feels a lot really white. So I guess the, the question I have is why, why, why be in a space like that? Why be in a space like that? Um, whether it's at the well, I know y'all ladies, you grew up in a diverse church, but with white leadership, Jennifer, I know you've been uh, participated in definitely more white majority spaces and churches as well. Uh, with this baggage that the American evangelical church has, why continue to choose to be in a space like that? Um, so I think um, I'll start with um, Sunday is still the most segregated day of the week of our cities, our schools, our nation. Sunday is the most segregated day. You have black people in black churches and white people in white churches and indians in indian churches and asian americans in asian american churches um and i don't think there's i don't in particular think that there's anything wrong with having a, a church where you're where you have community where you find um a large sense of community with people who are like you um i remember talking to elijah the other day and he said it was really important for his for his uh, first generation parents to be a part of a church um, that catered to Asian Americans because they didn't see other Asian Americans throughout the weekend. So it was really important, like a gathering space just for them where they could speak their language, where they could interact and, and um, you know, and people who weren't even Christians or who didn't even believe came to church and it was very important for them to come because that was that social aspect of it, that community. Um, for me, I have been raised in diversity. So I have been 
raised in diverse schools, in diverse colleges, and in diverse churches. And the place where I find the most, the most diversity um, has white leadership. It just does. Um, I, I don't see a lot of people, a lot of white people, or even other race people attending black churches. Um, so when I go to a black church, it's mostly 99% black people. Every once in a while, I'll see a, a standalone white guy or a standalone Hispanic person, <laughs> but our family, but generally they're all black. And that to me is not diversity. Um, and the same thing with a white church where it's all white people, that's also not a church that I am going to attend because I am not represented there and I am not comfortable there. And also they tend to not be welcoming. Um, I have gone for conferences and things like that, but to, to go on a regular basis, I, I want my contributions to be um, meaningful and not just overlooked. And so um, the plate, the spaces that I find that that can happen, where I can be most effective, where I feel God leading me are in diverse spaces. And those tend to have white leadership um, and, and white centric ideals. Anyone else? <laughs> uh, tend to, I think is right. Uh, mm -hmm. I was lucky. <laughs> and I do say I was lucky to yeah. find my church in New York. It actually did have a black pastor and was still very diverse. Um, there was a small church, but you know, to, uh, point Jennifer made a while, while, while back, this church was a part of an, um, umbrella of churches. And I remember looking at the one that was closest to me. It would have taken me 15 minutes to get to this church. It would have been wonderful. Um, but it was all white. And I was like scared to go in there because, you know, I don't want to be the only, <laughs> I don't want to be the only black or like there. I think I went to one church and this black couple chased me down because they were so excited to see another black person in their church. <laughs> and they really tried hard to get me to say, but that was in Houston. Anyway, um, I ended up going to the church where there was some diversity, where there was a black pastor, pastor and I think because he was a part of this uh, larger group of churches which had a white leadership over that, that was a part of why I think he did have, that church had more diversity in it. But um, it is, that's not the usual thing that you find. So I totally agree with Lawanda, but also I will say as far as like, why do I continue to go to the well? You know, sometimes God's put you places to minister. <laughs> Even if you're not on the stage or just to be diversity in someone else's life, like how can you move that needle forward? Um, God is not just working on whether or not you know him, but God, of course, is working on our hearts to rework us all in the image of him, in his image. Um, and when Lawanda and I looked for a church here, we had a difficult time. We started with uh, seeing what churches had statements of faith that aligned with what we believe. And we went and visited those churches. We did visit some um, majority black churches. We did visit uh, church, other, just all sorts of churches we visited. But there was always something off about those churches, something that didn't quite sit right with us. It didn't feel like we were home. And I remember when we went to the well, um, it, you know, the website, definitely the statement of faith aligned with us. Um, we also, the message that, I don't think Matt was preaching that day. It was around Christmas. I feel like, mm -hmm. David, you preached. Danny? I think it was Danny. I think you're right. I think it was Danny. No, he um, didn't preach good sermons. That was probably. <laughs> I think it was Danny because it wasn't you. It wasn't a white man. Okay. Um, but you know it the the word was aligned the interpretation like I will sit in service and I have those pings and sometimes I have to check myself because I'm like Tamika you're not all right um, but you know if everything was I, I think it the theology sat well and the, I also had this feeling of like hey I am home this is going to be our church and I remember Lawanda and I like 
looked at each other when we got in the car and we were both like, yeah, we're going back there. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of the reasons why I continue to attend and participate is because I trust God. You know, when I was in, when uh, the changes at our church, which the one that described one of them earlier, um, our high, the church I went to when I was in high school, they were really crucial changes, you know, and I, I just remember going through this period where I was like, well, maybe this is not okay. Um, you know, maybe the, the faith is not as rock solid as I believe it is. And I just remember God asking me, you know, is your faith in a church or in a person or is your faith in me? And I know that like at that moment I decided my faith was in God and that's still my decision today. Yeah, I'd agree 100%. I, it's easy for me to say, oh, I'm here because of a job, because I'm the children's ministry director. But at the end of the day, I loved the other church that I was at. Like, that was my family. And so what led my husband and I and our family to leave the place that we called home, 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 was that we're like, all right, God, what do you have for us? And this is what we believe that he had for us. And so deciding we want to be obedient, it'd be a lot easier to stay where we used to be. But this is how we feel God leading us. And so I think it kind of goes down to that point too. Um, yes, we're looking at, does it seem theologically sound? You know, do we feel like people are serious about, I actually want to follow Jesus, which includes loving my neighbors, whoever they might be, however God might be calling me to love them. Those are like, central but then also okay god what do you have to say about this <laughs> yeah and there is the other scripture which this is all about evangelism you know how will they know unless you go <laughs> all right how will they hear unless we are sent you know and it's like if there were no black people within these churches like then you you don't have that opportunity to form those relationships and have the opportunity to come alongside people. Churches are one of the places where I think you do have the opportunity to mix with people who are not um, like you. Yeah. So we've we've taken a look back of you know brief survey kind of uh, you know the history of racism in the church, how that's expressed today, but let's start uh, looking ahead and. You know, one of the trendy things right now, I, I'm glad it's trendy, but I'm also a little skeptical that it's trendy, is that churches uh, want to be about racial reconciliation and unity. And um, you, I mean, George Floyd was a catalytic moment, um, but you know, I get a little skeptical when there's churches I followed, I've never heard them talk anything about race and then George Floyd happens and then here's the pastor giving a sermon on it. And it's like, oh, I don't like, is this genuine? But that being said, there's a lot of talk about reconciliation, unity, let's pursue this. And so Tamika, this is actually um, maybe a pet peeve of yours or a passion of yours when we throw these terms around like reconciliation, unity, and it feels synonymous. Uh, but you had mentioned to me, you're like, no, no, we got to understand these terms if we actually want to pursue this stuff. And so if you could, could you unpack those terms so that we could have a better idea if we're actually pursuing this? Sure. I think people hear reconciliation and they think unity um, because reconciliation seems like a fancy way of saying, oh, we're all together in this. Oh, we are all one. But at the end of the day, you cannot have reconciliation without or you cannot have unity without going through reconciliation and um, unity is it is us like standing all together for one purpose with one thing in mind, right? But that means that we have to do the hard work of reconciliation, which means we have acknowledged wrongs, we have turned away from them, and we have made restitution of some sort as well. And um, I, I, I just want to bring up this one thing that I read, um, which is a statement by the, sorry, oh my gosh. 
<laughs> my family's always teasing me for having too many tabs open <laughs> and I am totally falling victim to that right now. Um, where is it? Oh man. Okay. Well, oh, that's, oh Lord. <laughs> Not only do I have too many tabs open, but I have two browser pages of tabs. <laughs> <laughs> um, but right. this statement was by the Alabama Department of Archives and History. And the um, in this statement, it's their statement of recommitment, and it was issued on June 23rd of 2020, which obviously that's after George Floyd died. And I think one of the things that probably feels disingenuous to you, David, is the fact that like you may hear people talking about uh, reconciliation or talking about racism who have never done it before. And the thing is, is that they've not even admitted that they've never acknowledged it before or that they have not tried to um, create a more diverse environment or a more welcoming environment. Or perhaps they have listed diversity as one of their aims, but Diversity is not just counting the heads or the numbers that are there, but also creating an environment that is welcoming to more than just one type of person. Um, but in this statement, it, I'm going to read the second point. It says the ADAAH, or the Alabama Department of Archives and History, is in significant part rooted in this legacy um, and it's it, earlier it says legacies of blatantly racist systems and that operated for hundreds of years. The state of Alabama founded the department in 1901 to address a lack of proper management of government records, but also to serve a white Southern concern for the preservation of Confederate history and the promotion of lost cause ideals. For well over half a century, the agency committed extensive resources to the acquisition of Confederate records and artifacts while declining to acquire and preserve materials documenting the lives and contributions of African Americans in Alabama. When I read this statement, I was so moved by the way in which they very clearly stated, here is uh, the legacy that we have been a part of, here has been our part in this legacy, and this is how our legacy has hurt other people. Now, this statement goes on to say um, other things about their commitment to making changes and to looking into the stories of others as well as creating room. I just put the link in there if anyone wants to check that out. But creating room um, for the people that have been ignored to have space within their agency. So so now diversity is not just a random aim for them, it's something that they are specifically putting resources into. So we as a church, as we just talked about, um, we talked about the far reaching uh, sort of violence <laughs> that churches have done towards black people and saying, you know, you can be saved, but you can't be free, which by the way, they literally changed the law because the law in England said that if you were a Christian, you could not be a slave. And in the US, which was still under English rule in Virginia, they changed the law so that even if you were a Christian, if you were a slave, you would still be a slave. So that is, it's not a, oh, well, this is an afterthought. No, they specifically made that change. But, um, you know, the, the church is, as a body has really done damage from back then, but also up until now with, for, with uh, not caring for its members, not creating space for people of other cultures. When people of other cultures are there, there's still this uh, sort of standoffishness or this sort of um, paternalistic attitude towards them where it's like, oh, we're going to teach you how to do things the right way because you obviously don't know how. Um, and within that, it's like we have to figure out how to acknowledge these things and how, um, what part do we as a larger church have to play? What part do we as individuals have to play in this? And I will just say for the well, you know, I think one of the reasons that we can be a part of this church is because the well acknowledges these things. This is not the first time that we've talked about something that is 
um, going towards reconciliation. That's the other thing is that reconciliation is a journey. It doesn't just happen poof. It's not like I became a Christian and all of a sudden, all of the um, other things, as a matter of fact, you know, I shared my um, story in our first session and I was a Christian from an early age. So really, like, there have been a number of things that have been added on as I've grown up and I've had different experiences. And I've realized things about um, churches or church people who are around me. And no one is asking for, like, someone who did not wrong, who did not, like, wrong you to to make restitution, like that's not quite it. But it's more, how do we as a body participate in this? How can we as a body give attention to people who are hurting? How can we as a body address the problems of people who are hurting? How can we as individuals call out the things that we see that are unjust and not participate either by silence or by adding to the offense? Yeah, and I would just add to that about the unity versus reconciliation piece that I think sometimes we do try to tell everyone to be united in a way that says, look, we can be united as long as you stop talking about your problems. Right. You have some hurts, keep them over there so we can keep the unity. Um, and I don't think that that's what God calls us to. Um, I don't think that that is... And I said, oh, we should talk about every single little problem we have, you know, all the time. There's obviously the, I don't know. Let me go back, make my point anyway. So let's go to Numbers 5, verses 5 and 6. <laughs> and it says, the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, when a man or woman wrongs another in any way, and so is unfaithful to the Lord, that person is guilty and must confess the sin he has committed. He must make full restitution for his wrong. Um, and so I think the principle there is that this repentance process is kind of twofold. There's the one we're turning from sin, like, um, sorry, Tamikia said, requires acknowledging our wrongdoing. Require, and that's where the confession piece comes into play. But then the other piece, the act of actually turning, means turning away from our sin and toward Jesus which means not continuing in whatever sin we were doing. So whether it's being complicit by laughing at people's racist jokes or saying your own racist things or whatever it is, just like not caring that if, even if you are not saying those things, but lots of people around you saying these things and just not caring that they're being said, it's saying to turn from that, which is an action that kind of has to be taken. And so the restitution or reconciliation piece is the turning from whatever sin we were just committing. Um, and I think that in sometimes in church, we want to just do the first part, part where we, one, we don't always even confess, like uh, Tamiki was talking about. But then sometimes we do get to that beautiful point where we're like, oh, snap, I've been wrong. I've been explicit in the things I've been saying and the ways I've been treating and thinking about other people based on the color of their skin um, or being complicit in my silence. We get to that point and then we cry tears and then we're like, okay, that's good. But we see that God's like, okay, now take the next step. The next step is not what saves you. It's the confession, the turning to Jesus, the believing in him that saves us. But that salvation moves us to action Move, and by the grace of God, by yeah. the power of the Holy Spirit, we are then transformed, which means we should change and not just sit here and be like, I'm sad that I have done those things in the past. Is that not enough? No, actually, it's not. And that's where the reconciliation piece comes into play, I would say. And then through that reconciliation, we get a type of unity that is deep, that honors God, and that I, don't, I think it just speaks something to the rest of the world, that look what the power of the Holy Spirit can do. Look what Jesus does. And this is how we, sh part of how we show the world the light of Christ, not by saying, look how united we are. We're not talking about any of our problems and we're getting along great, you know, but I think that there's a temp real temptation to do that in the church, especially as it comes to race and racial reconciliation.
Um, but Wanda, I want to ask you this. Uh, what would you say, let's take someone like me, white guy, right? I've been racist. Sometimes I still do racist things. Um, and, but I want to be on this journey of reconciliation. I want to be part of the change. I don't want to be part of the hindrance. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to help, right? I want to follow out my convictions of faith. I'm, I'm a Christian. I want to, uh, I want to pursue this. And so what would you, what would you recommend to someone, uh, like me or yeah, anyone who's like, man, I just, I want to help. I don't want to hurt. So um, the main thing that I would tell you is bloom where you are planted, which is a catchy saying that I've heard many times. You've probably heard it too. Um, but I think it's, it's a real saying that you take the place where you are and that is where you make the most change. So I don't think that it is effective for you to go out and try to meet all the black people <laughs> I don't, please don't drive around trying to pick them up or anything like that um, I think you go to work and you speak up if you see an injustice you don't stay silent whether you are at the gas station uh, pumping gas and you see someone being rude to a person or you are a teacher at a school and you see or you hear children bullying someone because of the way their skin hair hair or any the way they dress it doesn't matter um you put a stop to it you open your mouth and you literally say this is not right um, and you you are that voice now, the hands and feet of God going out into the world to bring about good, to bring about love, to bring about change. And I think that's where you need to start, um, as well as it is very important to know history. It is vital. I was having a conversation with a lady today earlier, um, and she is black and her husband is white. And one of the questions that she asked me was, how do I have these conversations with my husband? Um, because he believes that um, everyone is Every, that white privilege doesn't exist because he was, they, they basically raised six, his parents raised six children on $1,800 income. Um, but they had a house. They didn't pay rent because their grandparents paid off the house. They lived in a nice neighborhood. Like you, you don't understand the benefits of the, the things that came before you. And how did he buy, how was the grandfather able to buy the house? He used the GI Bill, which was denied to black soldiers when they came back from war. So you have to know your history before you can say, well, I, please, please, before you disagree with someone, understand what they are saying to you. Go back, research, learn the history. Why do you believe that? Open your heart and your ears before you open your mouth, unless you are standing up for someone. If you are standing up for someone, open your mouth. But if you are engaging in conversation, if you're trying to understand what someone is saying, you don't understand a viewpoint or a slogan or a protest or whatever it is, close your mouth, pick up a book and get some history. Please, please, please understand the history of the people who have come before you before you try to engage in a conversation or dialogue because that is just very very important and I'm, i think that's where that's where you go that's that's where you start i'm going to add on to that just doing the work of interrogating how you, what privileges do you have? Mm -hmm. And I think we all have that work to do um, as citizens of the United States because we all have some amount of privilege and that affects how we look at or uh, move through the world. And that's really, it's just important work to do that if you don't understand where you're coming from, just like if you don't know history, you can't address the situation. If you don't understand where you're coming from or what has happened to you, you also won't, won't understand what you're missing. Mm -hmm. uh, Luana, I love what you said, like 
educate your, I mean, repent, right? We want to, I think Jennifer um, mentioned that. We want to repent. We want to acknowledge our sins. We want to educate ourselves. And that's work. <laughs> that's a lot of work. Um, but God didn't say Christian life is easy. You know, pick up your cross. That's a lot of work. And then bloom where you're planted. And, you know, if you're in youth ministry, all right, how can I, how can I take these privileged white kids and, and, and expose them to things they're not going to see? If I'm uh, a, a teacher, right? How, how can I use my platform to further promote, you know, the justice of God in these issues? If my wife was a recruiter at IJM. And she was, you know, they didn't have any diversity and inclusion push when she was there, but she just put it in her mind, I'm going to hire people of color at the workplace because this is the right thing to do. And so I, I love that uh, of being, uh, of just blooming where you're planted. Yeah, um, I think that that's yeah. why God has Christians all over the world, yeah. um, that it is not everyone's job to be a missionary or an evangelist or a pastor um but there are people in this world that i am going to reach with my everyday life mm -hmm. and there are lives that will be changed and affected by just me being who i am and if who you are is a child of god then you need to be loving other people standing up for what is just, what is true, what is right, what is good. And that's how you move forward. Uh, last question. You always want to try to bring it back to the gospel, but my dogs are all coming out here. <laughs> um, how does the gospel relate to this pursuit of reconciliation and unity within the church uh, where does the god where do we find the gospel really impact these areas and, and jennifer i'd love for you to kind of lead us in that um so i guess i would just start by saying that the gospel is not about making you comfortable mm -hmm. um it's about showing you who you actually are so you can see who God actually is, showing you the depths of your sinfulness. So you see your need for Jesus, who is the only one who saves. And so you see his glory through his grace and mercy to you, a wretch, and to me, a wretch. And so I just feel like a lot of times when we get uncomfortable, when we start talking about hard things, we, uh, some of us, regardless of what it is, we'll talk about specifically race, we wanna shut down, we don't wanna see um the mirror to see what's actually going on inside and to that that's where i have to say that the gospel is not here to make you comfortable that this book is supposed to show you just how ugly your heart actually is um, but then it just shows you that much more how beautiful your savior is and so i think um knowing that that we shouldn't fear looking inward and asking the hard questions and we shouldn't be shocked when we see oh my gosh, there actually might be some prejudice in me. There actually might be some things in me that are like scary to see. We shouldn't be shocked by that because what the gospel has to say about us. Um, I know David likes to, who's it, Tim Keller? I don't know, who's the person that says that saying that you love? What is it? Can you tell us what it is? Uh, we are more sinful than what we want to believe, but we are more loved than we could possibly imagine. Yeah, so I love that. And I keep going back to that, especially as it comes to this, Thing about racism because I think a lot of the hearts that are kind of closed off when people don't have ears to hear it's because they don't want to hear that they don't want to hear there I'm not racist I'm not part of the KKK I'm not this that and the other um, but I think that not being willing to do a heart check maybe shows a lack of belief of deep 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 belief in what the Bible has to say do you believe that you're more sinful than you think or are you so arrogant to think that you're mostly good and the bad people are the racists out there, the KKK members, the this, that, and the other. Um, but I think the gospel frees us from being afraid of who we are um, because we know we're bad. We know we're sinful. We know that we don't think pure thoughts. We know that we don't treat people the way that Jesus treats us and the way that we ought to be treating them. And so just always coming back to that place like you're bad, but Jesus was good for you. And so now because Jesus was good for you, when you trust in him, 
you are no longer a slave to sin, which means that what are you free to do? Your freedom in Christ is not to continue in sin. It's to be free from bondage to your racism. So I think that that's like, to me, that's a super hopeful thing um, that you are free to serve Christ now. You are no longer in bondage to sin um, and that now you have the power to overcome your racism. So yeah, I'm just going to stop there. But <laughs> And Tamika, we were talking about how the gospel even gives, um, correct me if I'm wrong, like equity in a sense to different groups, okay. right? Yeah, I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I think God is really equitable and um, understands that we, uh, not understands, but knows what each of us needs. And I think you see that all over the Bible, um, just in the in the ways and in the places that God meets people, even if you look at the difference between David's story and Joseph's story, if you look at the difference between their stories and Esther's story, you know, um, God provided right ways for uh these the things that needed to happen to happen and for his his plan to work out um but and i i think we just we just have to acknowledge that that like the bible is not um like while the bible is for all of us it god is going to reveal himself in different ways to each of us and what I have to deal with may be different from what Lawanda has to deal with or what you, David, have to deal with, or we may all have to deal with the same issue and just have different ways that we have to come, come at it. So, yeah, I would agree, you know. Yeah, and, and I think then James, um, James gives this really interesting example. He's talking to rich and poor Christians, and he's, I think of this in James chapter one, and he says, rich, rich Christians, like, humble yourselves. Like, you're not a big deal, right? Gospel. You're more sinful than what you want to believe. And he says, the poor Christians take, like, pride in your, like, position in Christ. Right. Like, you're actually really important when the world tells you that you're not important. And I think that same principle can be applied not just with class, but also with race. And I think that's just... We just serve a great God, and it's I love the gospel of Jesus Christ. Want anything you uh, you want to add regarding the how the gospel relates to any of this stuff? Well, I would just like to read Romans, <laughs> Romans fourteen one through twenty, uh, verse one. I'm just gonna read this. Um, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. I just think that is what God is saying to us that it is not for us to say this person is good or these cultures are good and these cultures are bad but it is God who makes him stand whether black white purple green orange whatever <laughs> amen amen yeah well we um Ladies, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking three weeks uh, in the month of August and sharing your stories with us, uh, having the courage to be vulnerable, uh, to be brave, uh, to share hurtful experiences that you've had, um, and then, but also to, to lead us, uh, to teach us, and to show us uh, a way forward. And... All y'all, I love y'all. Um, God has used you, is using you, and is going to continue uh, to use you to bring forth uh, reconciliation and unity uh, in our communities. And so uh, for people tuning in, we're so glad that you're tuning in. I do want to give a plug or a shout out. We are starting, this is super ambitious, but uh, I think as we learn from the ladies, we have to educate ourselves. Um, and so we are doing an 11 week thrive on race. We're calling it Race 101. 
creating a common memory. And I, I can't recommend this enough. Um, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> so uh, I'm facilitating it with, along with Clarence Ming and Danny Chung. But we're, and I call it facilitating because we're basically going to be inviting just a lot of guest speakers. And so we're starting like at the very beginning. So what does the Bible say about race, which is actually doesn't really say anything about race, right? Um, because race is this construct that developed afterwards. But then we're going to trace how uh, Christianity kind of became this whitewashed religion. So that video that I just attached on the chat, I'm going to try to actually get him to speak to us via Zoom live on uh, that particular chat. If he's too expensive, we'll just watch that YouTube video. Um, but then we're bringing in uh, Mark Charles, who is a, a, a Christian Native American pastor and presidential candidate, who is going to speak to us about the impacts of colonialism on race and Christianity. And he has one of the most powerful lectures I've ever heard on uh, the doctrine of discovery. And so I've mentioned it a few times in my sermons, but I, he's, uh, we're bringing him in, him in live. He's the real deal. Um, powerful, powerful, powerful. Uh, we're also uh, gonna be talking to leaders in our community. Uh, there's an organization called Casa, uh, I'm gonna mispronounce the last name, Casa Chirilangua. Um, it's a Christian community development organization in Alexandria, Virginia that uh, ministers to immigrants in this one particular neighborhood. And so the executive director of this organization and alongside an immigrant are going to share their story uh, with us. And so we're going to basically trace race from the beginnings to then seeing, hey, how is this kind of racial narrative of whiteness, of white supremacy impacting these different groups? So we're gonna hear uh, a story. Um, we're trying to bring in the Japanese American Citizens League organization to speak to us about the power, um, not the power of, but the impact of uh, inter internment camps, of how that happened and how we see some of those themes even played out today. We're gonna uh, do hopefully two justice walks. So. Uh, there's an organization in D.C. that does justice walks. And so we want to see the impact of white supremacy and how that influences even gentrification in our own backyard and the inequalities that, that come from that. And so I cannot recommend this enough. Uh, we have some assigned reading for it, uh, but it's going to be 11 weeks. It's Thursdays, uh, 7.30 to 9.00. And then when we do the justice walks, that will probably be like on a weekend. So we'll kind of talk over those details. What's um, the date, David? It starts September 10th, I believe. September 10th. So I can, everyone listen up. This is maybe one of the best evangelistic tools that we have today, right? Who doesn't want to learn more about race, right? And then you can guilt them and shame them if they're like, I don't want to talk about it. Like guilt them, shame them use all the white guilt, whatever, bring them in. And then, man, because we would love to study this history, but then listen, if they're not going to go to the church, they're going to go to some secular liberal stuff. And they're, and it, ultimately it's hopeless. But Christians, we can use that education and then bring the hope of the gospel because we do have that hope, right? Jesus is the one who's going to bring, make all this work out one day. And so we have that hope. Um, so anyways, it's, it's Race 101. It's Thursdays uh, starting September 10th at 7.30. And so sign up. You can go to the What's Happening page on our website. And we would love, 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 love uh, to have you. But that being said, that's my little shout out, my, my shameless plug. Uh, ladies, thank you so much. Love y'all. And this was a lot of fun. And I'm sure we will, we will do this again sometime soon. So God bless y'all and have a great evening. See you later.